Okay, we got a tape. It's recording. Thank you, Eduardo. You would, I would have, wouldn't have done it. <laughs> okay, Lynn, uh, we have a special guest tonight. We have a piece of paper up here at the front with a, with a pen, I think. And during the, the session, you may a question may pop in your head. You can write it down on this piece of paper, and we will try to um, ask our guest tonight, Linda Moulton Howe, the question. Um, I had an uh, earlier session with Linda this afternoon, and she said she's open to any subject. But um, first, I want to sort of um, describe the guest who we have here. I've known Linda probably 30 plus years. I first had used to do phone calls with her back in the 1980s. And I still have, um, I think I still have some audio tapes of conversations. And they're long since been piled away. And this is one of the questions I had for Linda that she can maybe start with is you've got a massive collection of. Uh, material that you've collected over the years. I'm wondering what you're going to do with all your material that, that you've done from 1980 on. It is a question that haunts me now. Jim Mars and I talked about it. God rest him wherever he is. I know that his wife is working out some sort of an agreement now with the University of Texas to take some of Jim's files um, I have an entire garage full of nothing but files, folders, boxes, uh, more than two or 3,000 audio tapes, um, and the, the earth files, all of it. And it's as if we need some sort of a, whether it's with a university, which would be my preference, where there is a group of us who have an enormous amount of material, some of mine I know, is highly sensitive and highly true, and those uh, files have never been just raw in the light of day, but I would like to have a legacy for you, for me, for all of us, and I think it's coming to a point where I've been thinking about calling the University of New Mexico um, in Albuquerque. I know Ray Boucher is considering the same thing at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, it is a very relevant question, especially since you and I and others feel like we are at the year of 27 to 2018 when finally these headlines, we're not alone in the universe, are going to emerge. And that once that happens, then all of this work that is in all of these garages and basements and offices, I think it does need to be brought to a place. And maybe it is something for Kickstarter, for a group of us to make a presentation on Kickstarter that we would like to do a museum type quality uh, building or facility, the question would be where, to house all of this evolving material that eventually the entire world grant is going to know is largely true. Beautiful. So let's go through your career. You start, um, you're a, um, a high level sort of um, producer, TV person. Can you go through so your background, um, how you get dragged into this, and maybe go through the uh, famous days in Denver where you win the Emmy Award and stuff like that, and how this thing all evolved for you? Because you have lectured, I think, around the world. I would say you're probably in the top three of the most famous researchers there are, the most well-known researchers, and, and we all know that, you know, when you're there, the room is packed, and uh, so I, I, I mentioned this this afternoon that you might want to spell out some things, because most of the people in this room, the closest conference we have is probably 20 hours away, so a lot of the people in this room aren't familiar with the conference scene and, and haven't seen uh, the speaker, so maybe go through your history, where you've lectured, I know you've won probably every award there is, but how you got dragged into this whole thing. Okay, well, let's start at age four. My parents said that I was begging them for a telescope and a piano, and that for some reason I was born into this life with a love of those two things. And my, when my dad got me a, uh, I think back then it was a 60 or $70 uh, dinoscope reflector telescope, it became my best friend in the world. And I uh, spent so many nights from grade school on. And then I uh, put a notice in the Boise uh, Library 
anybody interested in astronomy, call Linda Moulton. And I still remember the phone number, 208-343-9648. That was our home in Boise, Idaho. And six guys called me up and we started the Boise Astronomical Society, which we did through high school and it continued on to this day. And then uh, that love of science and essentially uh, the organization, I guess you would say, uh, um, and the depthness of music. When I got to the University of uh, Colorado, I wanted to be an astronomer, I thought, but I was also, even then, I was pulled in everything that I did through high school into college to write. I wrote on high school and college newspapers. I really liked the ability to go out to events and report what was going on. And when I was at Stanford University in Palo Alto from 66 to 68, getting my master's degree in communication, I was covering all of what then seemed like a rebellion that was going to tear the United States apart between my college generation and the White House administration over the Vietnam War. And ultimately, that college group did prevail with LBJ. And so that began to harden my decision that instead of going into the hard science of astronomy, I was going to go into journalism and report about science, the environment, and medicine. So out of Stanford, I began working as a street reporter for KNBC in Los Angeles. And I covered everything from the Academy Awards to murders. I remember the first murder. And in some ways, I'm bringing it up only because I thought the other day about the resonance with what I would be doing a decade later in my first trip to animal mutilations. And that murder in LA was a young college girl inside of a uh, multi-storied parking lot. And I got one of the first calls. And when I got there, I was the only reporter. And my personality is always to run toward whatever I am trying to understand or am assigned to. And I ran into this parking, not knowing what it was going to be like to confront a body in a parking lot. And I still, to this day, it's as vivid as if it happened a second ago, because this girl was, had a hat on, had a beautiful coat on, beautiful shoes, and it was as if somebody had just laid her down, and the only evidence of violence of any kind was a tiny trickle of blood from the corner of her mouth onto the cement. And as I stared, sort of unnerved, I realized whoever did this could still be in that parking lot. And I remember running back out and calling to see if any of the camera crews we're going to be there. And that was the beginning of what 10 years later that I still remember the first time that I walked into a pasture with law enforcement with a camera crew to look at the dead body of a mutilated animal. And in a strange, eerie way, it was a little bit like what happened in the parking lot in Los Angeles because as we pushed through these willows that were about five feet thick of willows that went to tree branches, a whole another five or six feet of tree branches, and the men with me, they are all pushing hard through the willows and through the branches trying to get us where underneath a tree, that when you got under all these branches that hung, hung to the ground, we could stand up, the men could stand up, and I could stand up. And what was under this tree that was like a, an umbrella over us was a black and white steer that had, it was lying on its right side, the left ear had been removed in a perfect quarter size circle, no blood, completely dry. They, there was a perfect circle like you would do with a compass around the eye. The eyeball, the eyelids, the eyelashes, everything was absolutely clean except the bone was there and quite uh, beige white. 
And then the tongue had been removed deep in the throat. Uh, the genitals had been removed in a perfect oval about exactly what I'm showing you with my fingers. And the edges were hard and brown, but everything else was absolutely fresh, no blood. And the rectum had been cored out about six to eight inches into the body of the animal. And I remember that the sheriff uh, with the deputy turned to my crew and to me and said, tell me what bothers you about this scene outside of the animal? And what we all realized is that we've got this umbrella of thick branches. We had to push through thick willows to get it under there. And there's not one disturbance. There's not any broken limbs, not even broken twigs. The ground was clean. The animal was clean. And when we said that to the sheriff, he said, yeah, that's what bothered us when we finally found this in here. And that sets the tone that from Stanford, where I graduated with a master's degree in communication in 1968, my master's thesis was with the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, they were just beginning to use computers to try to analyze the uh, atomic bombardments at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. So my master's thesis was about all of that work. Uh, I worked for two years with the Stanford Medical Center creating a documentary uh, having to do with what happens to preemie babies when the mothers and fathers cannot touch their skin because of pop problems with ger uh, germs. And that film that I did, Stanford used for 19 years and sent me a letter at the end of those 19 years saying, thank you for having done this uh, documentary. And when I went to KNBC and when I was doing hard news, it was really, really a perfect, uh, it was a perfect thing for what was gonna happen in the rest of my life because every day, I was working 18 hour days, seven days a week with no break. And finally, when I went into documentary, I was married then and my husband uh, went to Harvard University to get another degree for work that he wanted to do. And I was hired to do all the medical programming at WCBB in Boston. So I did everything that you can imagine in terms of diagnosis, and treatment in every disease possible. And then I did all of their science programming. And I am very honored that I was uh, acknowledged with a Peabody Award in Boston for the science and medical work that I did. And then my husband was hired to Denver to work for Time Inc. on the development of cable. That seems impossible, but where we were then, it was just starting out and uh, we lived in Denver because that's where he was assigned. And I was hired at the CBS station to continue to do the medical and science work that I was doing in Boston. But they also wanted me to expand into issues affecting the state of Colorado. And by the summer of 1979, I had already won a lot of uh, different awards and the station, I was the manager of a department and the, what I did was totally 100% in my hands. And I uh, heard one day at lunch for the crew when we were working on a project, my audio guy said, Linda, I've just come off of a shoot for 2020 uh, New York. It's a brand new show. And he said, we went out into Kansas and Nebraska. He said it was the darndest thing. We were going to these sites of these animals, mostly cattle, no blood, and they were uh, bloodless, trackless. And he said, you know how you are such a stickler with me about keeping my battery belts uh, charged. And back then, it's hard to believe today, but we had to work as a crew, like a ballet team, because all of us were umbilical. The cameraman and the audio were hooked by cords. There were nagras that had crystal sync. If you interrupted that, you would not have sync in your film. And I had to work with them. So the three of us were always working together. And what we lived and died on 
was did we have enough charged battery belts that we could get through a day of filming to the next day on the charged belts and that's what he meant and he said you know how i always kept them going for you on on anything we did and he said i was now working for the network and we were charging belts every night and he said we went out to where these animals were lying on the ground and we would go to run the camera and nothing would work linda none of the battery belts stayed charged in any of these locations to the animals that we went and he said it was the most frustrating thing and i think that new york is going to scrub and i said how much did they shoot he said well we th think it was about 110,000 feet back then that was an impossibly large figure so i called up the executive producer in new york who was rune arledge in the beginning and i said my name is linda howe and i'm uh, the director of special projects at the cbs station in denver and here's what i've heard from a cameraman working with me on a a documentary what are you doing with all of this hundred and ten thousand feet that you shot on these animals and he said oh we chucked that we're in the business of news and we could never get any hard answers that was the turning point of my life to hear somebody in new york say that they had trashed one hundred and ten thousand feet of this expensive double system film and audio because they couldn't get any answers to what was happening with the animals, let alone why the battery belts wouldn't hold charge, I began. And the very first, uh, within two weeks of that discussion with the guy in New York, uh, I went up to visit a sheriff up in uh, Logan County, Sterling, Colorado. And I had been told that he had from the early 1970 to uh, where I was starting in 79, that he had one of the largest uh, over 200 cases that he had investigated. And I looked at all of these color Polaroids that he himself had taken at mutilation scenes. And I was seeing uh, things that were so uh, troubling about the fact that a steer could have its head down in a hole, the whole rest of the body completely and totally paralyzed, not a track around the animal's body, meaning if an animal walked to the scene and laid down, you would see the animal's tracks. These animals have no tracks around them. And when I asked him about it, he said, we came to the conclusion that something had the ability to paralyze this animal, but left its head unparalyzed. And as the ear, the eye, the tongue, the genitals, and the rectum tissue were taken, the animal dug the eight inch hole with its head in its agony. That was the first moment that I remember, perhaps in my entire life up to that point, that I could be contemplating getting into a story in which something was deliberately hurting animals while they were taking tissue, but that it was so unhuman logic because there was no blood, no fluid and no tracks. And in that paradigm shift in front of Sheriff Tech's graves, that's when he said to me, Linda, I'll save you some time. We know the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. Well, that was like a 220 volt circuit hitting me. Up to that moment, every single thing in my life had been hard science, hard medicine, everything. And now I have a sheriff looking at my eyes from his eyes and saying that what I am looking at in his Polaroids are the perpetrated mutilations by creatures from outer space. Nine months later, I would have worked again 18 hour days for nine months without a break. And at the end of those nine months, what the crew and I saw with our own eyes, lights in the sky where mutilations were occurring, talking with reporters and so many law enforcement who had seen beams coming out of glowing disks in the sky, a rancher who told me that he had seen one of his own animals rise in a beam of light from a pasture, 
And when I said, I need you to stand in front of my camera and tell that to the world audience, they said, no, 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 you'll have to get somebody else. To this day, in 2017, September 5th, I have talked with half a dozen people who with their own eyes have seen beams of light rise up or lower, animals that would be found mutilated, but none will go on the record. The closest is in my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, my third book. And that is a story in Oregon at Sand Springs. And I was able to talk with that man who was a witness directly. And that was where, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he is waked up from a sound sleep in a trailer and hears branches breaking in the trees around his trailer. And it scares him. And he runs out and he sees a big glowing disc in the night sky. He sees a beam and he knows that in, and concludes it must be cattle because he's so scared. He said, I was so scared, I admit it. I was there to protect those cattle, but I ran back into the trailer as he could hear body after body after body being dropped and didn't go out there till the sun was up in the morning and there were six mutilated cattle, each one had fallen hard enough to create craters, which is one of those signals that you see in cattle mutilations. And after A Strange Harvest was broadcast on May 25th, 1980, it was the single largest audience in the state of Colorado since that time and before. It was a 19 rating and a 37 share in both Nielsen and Arbitron. It stunned the TV station manager. But why? What did that mean? They started bringing, I think it was a thousand and some letters that had been typed or handwritten. They started bringing them to my office in these big gray bags. And the phone, they couldn't keep up with the phone numbers. And everybody was saying the same thing. I've never told anyone this before. And then it was mutilations, sightings of UFOs, helicopters that changed into clouds, a disc that changed into a square, uh, all kinds of high strangeness phenomena. And I realized with, with my film, A Strange Harvest, that earned one of the three Emmys that I have had in my life, that I was scratching the surface of an enormous iceberg and all of this communication from people, I felt that I had to keep going. To have this kind of a response, to have the station manager stunned that nobody had ever seen audiences like this. So I started gathering up material to do another documentary because I was the head of that department. And about two to three weeks after that first broadcast in 1980 of A Strange Harvest, I got a phone call from the general manager of the station. And he and I had gone back to New York together. I had a, a, a national Emmy nomination on other documentaries that I had done. I think mean, it was just the year before in 78. So he trusted me. We, we worked together well. I would have considered him a friend. And I, when I got to the door, I could see that on his face, he wasn't happy, like, like scowling. And he said, shut the door. Linda, I know that you want to keep investigating the animal mutilations and the UFOs and all of that. But you can't. Because we're not going to lose commercial sponsors over this. And I, I remember that it's a, it's a mark of how naive I was at the time. Because it took me a couple of minutes for it to sink in. That basically what he was saying is that somebody had come to the station and said, you don't let her do any more on this or we will pull advertising. And... Now today, in 2017, looking back at the last 38 years, 
when Richard Doty, who allegedly worked for the Air Force Office, Office of Special Investigations that you probably all have heard about, but I think he worked for an alphabet soup agency. And that's, the more you get into this, the more you realize that our government at the alphabet letters, they embed in embassies, they embed in Secretary of State positions, they embed in AFOSI around the world, people to keep track of those subjects that are verboten as well as to control in other ways. And so when I look back, the very first effort to block my doing anything more beyond a strange harvest was my own general manager at the station who had been a friend. And that when you go through all of the, when I had the contract for home box office, which came uh, two years after a strange harvest was first broadcast, home box office screened my documentary uh, I was having discussions with the second and third in command at HBO. They said, we want you to do an hour. Uh, we want you to go beyond the film you've done, but to do a documentary like you've done. And everything was signed and dotted, and I was working on what we were calling UFOs, the ET factor. And here comes the intrusion again to block me from being able to do the HBO special. And we could go into so many pieces of my life in the last 38 years, but I think because I want your questions, I'm going to say for those of you who would like to learn more where I'm stopping at the government blocking me and my having to decide whether or not I would try to keep going or not, and deciding I had to, that I would not be able to live with myself if I did not keep trying to understand what was happening to the animals, what was trying to keep me from doing investigations, what did it mean that somebody who managed a TV station could be that easily blocked around advertising. The same thing happened at CNN, I worked at CNN, uh, there's just been one place after another where everything would be a go and something always blocked it. And that if you want to understand more, uh, my books, An Alien Harvest, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1 and 2, and Mysterious Lights and Crop Circles, are uh, the best legacy that I can hand to you to try to understand the backstory and then we come to today in 2017 and Grant and I and others we have been through a lot of up and down up and down yes it's going to open up yes they're finally going to tell the truth and everything always keeps being slammed down and for all of you sitting there in the audience in Canada I don't know how many of you have any doubts in your mind about whether or not we are alone in this universe, but I can tell you with 100% conviction, we aren't alone and we never have been, and that very advanced intelligences have been interacting with this planet, as one DIA man told me after he retired and sought me out through a World Bank colleague for one of the most extraordinary discussions of my entire existence. He said, our government has proof that three competing geopolitical, territorial, conflicting extraterrestrial biological entities have been manipulating DNA, harvesting DNA, and terraforming this planet for 270 million years. And when I said, sir, that's before the time of the dinosaurs, he took a beat looking straight into my eyes and he said, Linda, one of those groups made the dinosaurs. They were an 80 million year experiment. And what we don't know is was that asteroid that went into the Gulf of Mexico, and we call it the Chickaloo Crater, was that a cosmic accident? Or is it 
that the beings that had set in motion the dinosaurs wanted to move on to another laboratory experiment here on Earth. And they provoked it or didn't prevent it in order to take out one experiment and put in another. And the next one was the rapid rise of mammals of which Homo sapien is a member. So Grant, I'll throw yeah. that open to questions. Okay, um, you mentioned Richard Doty, that was I think April of 83, and um, one thing I should point out to people, you have sort of a photographic memory for dates and times and yeah. almost, almost everything else. And I think the first thing Richard said to you when you got into his office at Kirkman Air Force Base is the government didn't like the documentary you did on, oh. on, on abductions. Or on, on calculations. I'll give you the exact sentence. After going through all these punch, where there's five or six punch buttons, and you wait for somebody to punch the locks, to go through doors, to go into a corridor, to go into a big office. As we were walking into that office, and I uh, was there, I thought, just to get the names of, from Ellsworth Air Force Base, of some witnesses that Peter Gersten, the attorney in New York, uh, representing Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, I was there at that meeting because Peter Gersten had met and had dinner with me in New York City after I signed the HBO contract. And he said, we've got this guy in Kirtland uh, named Richard Doty, showed me all this correspondence. And he seems to be sympathetic to the citizens against UFO secrecy trying to get out facts about UFOs. And he said, we've got this amazing Ellsworth case where there a silver disc lands, a security guard comes out with a gun because this is landed, uh, draws the gun, the thumb portal opens up in the silver disc, a green laser beam comes, and he said, the entire gun in the security guard's hand was evaporated in an instant, but that there was no ser serious burns to the hand flesh. And he said the United States government wanted that technology when they saw that. Well, this is what I thought it would be 30 minutes going into Kirtland, getting the names of the eyewitnesses in Ellsworth. So that Peter Gersten, Larry Fawcett, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, and me, we would do a segment for my documentary on HBO. That was the entire reason that I was at Kirtland Air Force Base on April 9, 1983. So when this AFOSI agent is leading me into this office after all the punch lock doors, he says, you know, you broadsided the U.S. government with that documentary of yours. And I was, I remember, I was so both shocked by that statement because in a way it was hostile. And I think that I'm there like a courier that Peter has set up this meeting. It was Gersten who arranged everything and had, and the only thing Dodie and I did was call to confirm the date and the phone numbers. And that I think I'm going to sit down and hear about Ellsworth and people who were eyewitnesses to this extraordinary uh, evaporation of the gun in the security guard's hand. And he, he starts out that way, that, the, you broadsided the United States government with that documentary of yours. And when I sat down, it was uh, not Ellsworth. He said, my superiors have asked me to show you something. And I want you to move from where you are, which was a chair right in front of the desk, which would be logical. I want you to move to that chair. And it was a big leather chair sort of in the middle of the room. And again, I was so naive then that it never occurred to me that I was being moved to a chair that would have video and audio full time and all you had to do was push a button in the desk, you'd videotape anybody in front. And that was confirmed for me. If I was there on April 9th, 1983, was probably around 2003 because I know I was in Philadelphia and I moved uh, to Philadelphia in uh, 1990 and I was there until 2004. 
So this, um, I crossed paths at a conference. The man who came up to me and he said, like some of these guys like to flaunt that maybe they're out of the alphabet soup and they want to, they want to flaunt themselves in a strange way. And he said, remember that day when you were at Kirtland? He said, well, I know that you were wearing a polka dot blouse and describes jewelry and the length of my hair. And I'm having a hard time remembering any, <laughs> what was I wearing. And, and it was as if it, it was almost like a confirmation. Yeah, when you were moved to that middle chair, you were videotaped. And that's what the guy said. Wow. So, yeah. uh, so let's go to what you've done. Like you got cut off, and we can maybe get into a little more of the Avery type people that you've run up against. But you, you got cut off by the, um, the media, the mainstream media. So let's go into what you've done to get your message out. For example, your website, your podcast. Um, your lecturing. Can you sort of go through what you've done in order to count, counter this um, interference in what you think is your mission? Yeah, and to use a bridge that I think is valuable for you and uh, the audience in Canada to hear because this really happened. And it really underscores how I guess I want to say how wired our government is in the United States, Canada may be indirectly. And this is what happened. I kept trying to push past all of the different blocks that were put into my path uh, working on that HBO project. And one of the things at the time that I could do was because I was married, my husband was an executive in timing, one of his very best friends, and he had served in the Peace Corps together in Africa, and he was the head of ABC Documentary. So I called him up, and we had known each other socially for a long time, and I said, uh, Dick, I really want to talk with you about something that's extremely important. And so within a day or so, we met to have lunch. And I laid out everything that had happened at Kirtland and a lot of other things I was exposed to. And that it was in the box of animal mutilations being done by non-human intelligences. And this man was very intelligent, broad-minded, complex thinker. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I actually believe you. I think you are telling me a truth. But Linda, the United States government doesn't have pockets deep enough to take on the federal government. I had another meeting with the head of documentary at NBC. I had even more documents, more photos I laid out on his desk. We were up in a high, high building in New York City, both of these meetings. These were real movers and shakers with the power to do this. And the NBC documentary director said, look, anybody can make documents. Anybody can make photos, even film. He said the same thing, Linda, we don't have pockets deep enough to take on the federal government, but if you can bring me somebody who is in the White House or the Department of Defense or someone like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, then we can sit down and bring in other people. And when you keep going through that, layer by layer, you begin to realize that the whole 70 years since World War II, it has been effectively created into a concocted landscape by people who are brilliant, counter-intel people are brilliant. They got us through World War II, 
And then they had the assignment that the media and the public are never to know about the UFOs and the ETs that England and the United States and our allies knew about, had private meetings about, and that the whole situation politically and in our, in our nation and Canada perhaps in, as an ally, the whole thing has been a concocted policy of denial and lie that has been cultured and controlled and designed by counterintelligence minds. And that is what I was up against. And when you realize that the networks in the United States of America, the people at senior levels, are not even in a position to challenge a policy of denial in lies in which they themselves have seen evidence that makes them think that it is a policy of lie, you come to a kind of crossroads, or I did, inside of myself, internally. <coughs> it's easy to give up because part of you knows you're, you're up against, as they said, pockets so deep that nobody's going to be able to take them on. But I'm sharing with you kind of my bottom line residue right now. I really honor the pressure of facts. I always have. And it seems to me in an odd way that what this life has taught me, you have to decide what you care about. And what I really care about is truth. Not in a silly way, in a fundamental way. <coughs> the truth of being in a universe where photons are entangled and that everything in this universe is hooked together, connected together like a net. And once you reach that point, the barter system of the world and so many other things, they don't matter. Because right now it seems to me that all of this has evolved to this very, very critical moment in which Brant knows, I was told that 2016, 10 years before 2016, I was told, Linda, it's on the timeline. We're going to open up. We're not alone in this universe in 2016. And that Grant and I and others in 2016, we were following everything that Podesta and Hillary and all of them were saying. And if she had been elected president, we probably would have had those headlines before this date. But for some reason, we have had a different roll of the dice. But on my side of what I was coming to, I don't really care who's in the Department of Defense or the White House. Because the one thing that I feel that all of us have to make a decision on, and then you put one foot in front of the other, and you just keep going. And that is, what is the most important thing that we could possibly try to do? Those of us that are convinced that we're not alone in this universe and that there are other life forms interacting with you as experiencers, interacting with this planet, that I have talked with people who have worked in the most sensitive agencies in the United States. And if you knew what they've told me, oh my Lord. So to you who have had interactions, no matter what the type, no matter with light, no matter with orbs, no matter in your bedroom, in a car, missing time, dreams. One of the most important stories that I've been working on for the last two years Start on June 29th, 2015. It was an army sergeant in the Southeast coming out of Hunter Airfield in Georgia. He got orders to go up to Fort Carson in Colorado. 
he makes a plan that he, his wife, kids, and animals will travel in their car at night or at day. So at night, no, let me make sure I do when it's cool. They were going to travel at night and then sleep in the day. He's a very sharp guy. I have met all of them. I have seen and been in the truck that is involved in this. And I will give you the short version. He had a GPS program. He'd been in the Army for about uh, 15 years by then. GPS uh, used all the time. Not, nothing, not, nothing at all a question. And he programs the, the GPS to go from the Savannah region in Georgia up to Fort Carson, and he wants to go through Atlanta. The next thing that he and his wife know on a road that they thought that they're on the way to Atlanta is that a bright light in the sky flares, huge. They both see it, they both say, what is that? And as if in an instant reaction to the answer to their question inside of this big white pickup, bang, this white light appears as this huge UFO literally pops down in front of the truck. He pulls over to the shoulder. This guy is very smart and what he does for the United States Army is he's been trained to look at anything that is in the sky and be able to tell distance, uh, size, uh, width, height, depth, uh, all kinds of things. This is what he does for a living for the United States Army. So when this thing comes down right in front of their road and he has to pull over to the shoulder, he told me later what went into his mind is, my God, this is about 820 feet in diameter, three times the size of a football field. There are symbols on it. His wife is reacting. He is reacting. The next thing that they know they're, they're stunned by this for maybe five minutes because his army training, he looks at his watch when it popped in front of the truck. He looked at his watch when it popped away like a light went up, and it was approximately five minutes of time on his watch. The next thing, when they start traveling and he thinks he's going to Atlanta, but he's so discombobulated that he tells his wife, I've got to stop. Something's wrong. I feel terrible. And they pulled into a little store with gas pumps. And when he went to open up the door on his truck, he fell out. He had to hang on to the door because his legs wouldn't support him. He said it, it reminded him if you took wet spaghetti and substituted that for your legs suddenly. And he's hanging on to the door of his truck. And his wife looks just as stunned and bewildered and out of it as he feels. And now, because he is a warrior type, it's making him more than he wants to stand on his own two feet. And he makes his hands go around the truck, trying to make his legs go. And eventually, he was able to step off goes in, gets some water and some stuff to bring to his family. And when he looks at the receipt, it says Wadley, Georgia. When you look at where Wadley, Georgia is on a map, here's Savannah, here's Atlanta, Wadley is over here. How, he said, could my GPS have allowed us to go off at a 90 degree angle out into this boony place, and neither my wife nor I ever knew it occurred. They get back on track, and they finally get to Atlanta in the early morning, and they check into a motel on the north side of Atlanta. They get an eight and a half by 11 receipt. They all go to sleep, and the next thing he knew, his eyes are opening. He's got one arm against the door frame to the right, and he's got a ballpoint pen in these fingers. 
his left arm is propped up against the other part of the door jam and he's holding, looking at the back of the receipt. But there are squares and ones covering the entire eight and a half by 11 sheet with the very end trailing off W T F. So, yeah, it's what he said to himself. And over the last two years, uh, he and I and his family have uh, had a lot of communication. He's continued to get binary code. And the binary code, because I think this is important to share, all of this is at earthfiles.com, which is my science uh, environment and real X files website that I have been producing since 1999. Uh, it has now uh, it's going to uh, reach almost 3,000 in depth reports by the end of this year. And yeah, to me, it is like having uh, an encyclopedia of uh, my work and my life. And now I'm getting uh, letters from professors in universities saying, I use your Earth Files archive now all of the time, for which I'm very grateful. So know that everything I'm telling you is in a series of reports at earthfiles.com. And here, so that you can understand, this is what, when I... Um, a scientist, a geneticist, did the translation of the first binary, and later I worked with a retired Navy captain, expert in binary, binary code. I'm dealing with people who know what they are doing with six or eight ASCII or any kind of code. And here is the summary of what, over an evolutionary period of time, from June 30th, 2015, from standing in the doorway with zeros and ones in the back of this receipt, to just recently, because this is so relevant to what Grant and I and others have been wondering could happen. Continuous protection of humanity, 49.27 north, 11.5 degrees east, expose hidden knowledge to all citizens, advancement imperative for planetary survival. Beware of Orion 1350.3 and Z reticuli 39.170. Avoid signal messages sent, meaning Hawking is saying we should not be sending out indiscriminately messages from this planet that it is dangerous. Between October 2015 to January 2016, the binary code translated imminent threat soon upon Earth's leaders and civilizations. Expose and disband hidden knowledge to all citizens. Employ safe and controlled joint study to all minds. Progression imperative for combined survival. Both of these then mean we're never going to survive if we don't all learn about everything that is happening. We cannot continue to live on a concocted planet in which 99% of the living souls are being denied the truth about the universe and the universe's relationship to this planet. Embrace this space vessel threat, implying that what is the threat has to do with some kind of vessel in space coming to Earth. Royal Emerther warning. Now, Emerther is a word that I never encountered before working with this army sergeant. I don't know if all of you have, but I'd be interested in knowing if any of you have had that word, E-M-E-R-T-H-E-R, -E -E uh, come to you. Royal Emerther warning, expose foreign technology to all for ev evolutionary advancement needed to prevent takeover. That was, he thought, the most uh, alarming of the messages up to that point. And I'm going to translate for you, what is that latitude longitude that he gave in the very first from traveling? And you will find this 
extremely confusing and interesting because in the very first translation of the binary code at that standing in that door when we looked up 49 degrees 27 minutes north and 11 degrees 5 minutes east described as continuous protection of humanity it turns out to be town center right at the town center of nuremberg germany on april 4th 1561 there was a ufo battle over nuremberg germany that was immortalized in the woodcut by hans glazer that or many of you have probably seen that has the red, black, orange, and blue discs and spheres and cylinders and crosses in the sky. And this fight went on for uh, quite a long time. And that was 400 years ago. And when you look at this, as uh, Sergeant CJ and I have talked about this, who in that aerial battle, that UFO battle over Nuremberg, Germany, would have been trying to protect humanity. That's the implication, that the war was with entities who didn't want to protect humans versus those that did in Nuremberg and then jumped to World War II. Nuremberg stands as an association with World War II and the Nazis and war crimes in which millions of people were gassed in gas chambers. The last really significant communication that we got was tremendously a puzzle. He started writing down at night. His wife told me that it, he was waking up a lot, saying zeros, ones, squares, ones. And I encouraged him to keep a notebook so that he could write them down as they came. And he could do it, he said, up to a point. And he described it a bit like Penniston did at RAF Bantwaters and some people in the abduction syndrome that I have interviewed over the years. They talk about seeing like a screen out here beyond their uh, forehead. And that in his case, the zeros and ones or squares and ones are moving from what he would say was his right side to his left side in a continual stream. And just like Penniston said, they looped, they didn't disappear, they uh, moved, but when he writes them down is the only time they finally move from the screen in his forehead, which is exactly what Jim Penniston said happened to him in December 1980. So imagine he wakes up and he's got these, he called them squares because that's the way they're drawn, but they serve as zeros and ones and they're, uh, they're running and then he starts with his pen and it is like on a loop. So if he didn't get it the first time, he watches it come back around and that's how he can refine <coughs> what it is until at some point, then it all goes away and, and that's that uh, transmission. Well, on February 18th, 2016, there were five new lines of squares and ones in his notebook and he called me. And I sent them to Australian geneticist Horace Drew, and he had been helping, and later the Navy captain also has helped. And when we got the clumps of letters <coughs> from the binary code translation, they were five clumps, N-A-B-U, R-A-K-B-U, capital H hyphen L-A-R-A-A-K, S-A-N-U, K-I exclamation point. That's the literal translation. <coughs> and when I received these email, the only part that seemed recognizable was the last K-I, which for any of you who have ever studied Sumerian or Mesopotamian language, uh, or even have any working relationship, you will learn that K-I was the word that was used by the Anunnaki and the Mesopotamians and the Akkadians for Earth. 
So that was the only clue we had that we might be dealing with a Mesopotamian language. And having lived for 13 years in Philadelphia and spent a lot of time in the library at the University of Pennsylvania, I had been in their Mesopotamian archaeology library, and it's fantastic. It has some things as good or better than the British Museum in London. So I called up uh, Professor Joshua Jeffers, PhD. He is the research specialist of royal inscriptions of the Neo-Assyrian period project at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in the Babylonian section in Philadelphia. And here is what he wrote back. The first two words and the fourth word look to be Akkadian and not Sumerian. The first could be the god Nabu, capital N, A, he is in boy, U. But without the cuneiform, it is difficult to say since there is no divine classifier before it. Now, Nabu, I had never heard of Nabu before. We'd all heard of Enlil and Enki and the Saragat and uh, Marduk, but I had never heard of Nabu. Well, then when you find out Nabu was in fact one of the three most important gods in Samaria. Nabu was the keeper of the tablets of destiny that recorded humanity's fate. He was son of Marduk and grandson of Enki Ea of the Anunnaki, and Nabu's grandfather Ea is the creator and protector of humanity because Ea created humans out of clay to be worker slaves for the Mesopotamian gods. But the supreme god Enlil was mad because humans were noisy. And then the professor goes on, that second word, R-A-K-B-U, would be the noun rider, from the verb rakabu to ride, frequently upon a horse or a chariot. Then he goes into various spellings on the middle word, which could be Sumerian or Akkadian, but could be the, the citing a place in Mesopotamia. The fourth word, sanu, could be an infinitive of the verb to do again, or a second time, to be different and strange. And finally, ki is earth. And then it seemed that what I had, the communication that came through his squares and one, Sergeant CJ's, was a statement saying Nabu, the third most important god of the Sumerians, was returning to earth in a glowing chariot. Combine that with the fact that Sergeant CJ, who stays in touch with me, feels an increasing urgency about this time. He doesn't understand himself. He knows these words. He himself says, something is coming and our government is very worried about it. And that boils down to, we have allies and we have enemies in space. There really are Battlestar Galactica wars. It's not science fiction. But Lynn Buchanan, who remote viewed for the Stargate project at the Defense Intelligence Agency at the end of the 80s, said that he and Joe McMonagall and Pat Price and all of them, when they remote viewed into the solar system and the cosmos, they picked up that there is life everywhere, that humanoids are a common form. And he said, we have a lot of allies but the enemies are so dangerous that the question would be, as Sergeant CJ has asked himself, are we at a time where human, humans that have been kept in the dark for centuries about the fact that the universe is teeming them with life and it's been seeding and harvesting from this planet for millennia, that we are going to possibly between now and 2020, 
that we are finally going to be told some version of some truth because something like Star Wars is headed our way? Question mark. And that, Grant, I throw to you. What do you think in the discussions that you have been following with Pandolfi and Dan Smith and those guys and the Tom DeLong and the John Podesta and Hillary Clinton and uh, Edgar Mitchell. And there's all these different facets that have been rethought. We were leading up to the big headline by now, even uh, Danny Sheehan uh, working with the Vatican uh, has said that the Vatican is standing by to help the United States make this statement. We're not alone. And would it come through fast radio bursts as light speed kinds of transportation? That seems to be a, a possibility. But Tom DeLong is working with Peter Lavenda on uh, the idea that they will use the metaphor of, of uh, cargo cults to get the world up to speed that other intelligences have been here so long and that humans have simply been a mimic of what has been in the sky. I mean, what is your perspective now? Well, I sort of see it um, that they are trying to get it out. That's why I'm uh, sort of trying to get your bottom line. So you figure that the government sees something very bad and that's why they've covered it up. That seems to go counter. Uh, that's what makes me puzzle why these guys are putting this stuff out. Do you see them uh, sort of figuring that we should know if we're in trouble or that this is about to happen? Is that what you see is going on? Or, or are they just sort of playing around with us? Because you, as you dealt with Tom DeLong, he contacted you. Uh, and I've had these indirect contacts with Pandolfi, but nothing ever really happens. We sort of, they, they sort of drag it on. And, and like Tom DeLong was supposed to make his announcement last um, Christmas and still nothing's happened. So that's the puzzling thing. Maybe you can talk a bit about um, the people you've been, um, dealing with and why you think that they are now coming forward to reveal what they're revealing or are they just playing with us? There really is a really serious piece to this and because of non-disclosure agreements I cannot talk about some things yet you would be one of the first people I'll go to when I can there's a very dangerous aspect but remember when I was saying all of the remote viewers, they all said, we, we have allies. We have allies. And it is possible that we are at the place that we are with government back engineered technology because we have had help. I don't have any question about that. I think that we have uh, so much technology that has been back engineered from collections from different sites since the 40s. But granted, it is that issue that seems to have haunted the earth forever. We, in all of our culture, in all of religions and mythologies, the one common theme, the common denominator everywhere on this planet is good versus evil. Something that is uh, from a divine and something that is from the non-divine. Why is that the why is that the yin and yang, a symbol of this universe? The white that has a dot of black, the black that has a dot of white. Why is it that the yin and yang in the Gnostic kind of point of view that there are there is something huge at stake in this particular universe that has to do with the evolution of souls and fights between something dark and light? Now, if, you, if Lynn Buchanan were here, he will say that he feels very positive that the allies to humans and Earth, <coughs> even if they are using and harvesting from Earth, that they are so strong that it doesn't matter if there is something out there that wants to destroy us, that we really have strong allies. So that is a distinct possibility from Lynn Buchanan's point of view. But Sergeant CJ, and there are others like him, but it's, he's the most impressive because his binary code in the night translates whether you're dealing with a Navy captain or 
binary is binary is binary. It's, it's zeros and ones, and there are laws, and you translate it. Yeah. And Keith is troubled. C Sergeant CJ is very troubled. He is in a military position. He loves his family. He loves uh, the United States. And he has nervousness about what it is that he senses in his gut, that something, if you want to say, is amiss, and just use that word, something is off, something is amiss. What is it? And if everything were good and positive, right from the get-go, if the Nazis had turned out to be angelic and the world ended up in a a cloud of, of wonderful positivity and there had not been the violence of a war, then maybe you could say, well, those were good ETs and they worked through humans and now we're in a world of peace and light. But that isn't what happened in World War II. And so we're at some kind of a fundamental crossroads about what are we, Grant, what are these standing up primates, one of many models that have been from Homo erectus two million years? If the, if the briefing paper that Richard Duddy showed me at Kirtland was true, and it said these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA and already evolving primates to create Homo sapiens. If you just take that one sentence and say, this is true, then we are somebody else's property, as Charles Fort said. We were made. But the thing that I've tried to understand is that if you have anybody in your life, a human or a cat or a dog, and you love them, and they pass, I have stood with a cat that I love so much and thought five minutes ago it was breathing and its heart was beating and now the cat hasn't moved nothing has changed except it has stopped breathing the heart is not beating and there is a palpable change of everything that force of life the soul, I am convinced that is the most important part of us. And that if there is a divine field who has inserted a very special soul in container bodies that were made by something to do slave work on earth, as the Anunnaki story is, then making a very strong and special soul to insert into cloned and hybridized slaves would be almost like a divine joke, that we may be the strongest of all, and that something about this moment, in this century, at this time, with somebody in North Korea threatening to explode a bomb that could take out, this is a fact, depending upon the size of a hydrogen bomb, it can take out 30 square miles, 30 square miles. To have reached this point of insanity on the earth at a time when there seems to be this sense that you and I and others, that if the government is over a barrel on something coming and they're finally just going to say, we are not alone. Fast radio bursts, light speed transportation. We have all kinds of genetic evidence on planet Earth, and they just start laying it out. Maybe it's going to come at the most critical time on the Earth when something as stupid and insane as a hydrogen bomb threat is making us all look at our own mortality and saying, what if, what if, a huge amount of population went out in the fire of a hydrogen bomb. How insane is that? And on the side of why I'm bringing it up, 
if Earth has been manipulated by competing geopolitical, territorial, extraterrestrials, other dimensionals, time travelers, the whole ball of wax, if there has been manipulation of Earth using humans, fighting through humans, working through humans, and who might be manipulating the character in North Korea to act the way he's acting because there is a war going on that we don't even see. Let me, let me make it a little more complex. You gave a, um, a famous speech in Eureka Springs and two of the people in this room were there and heard it. I was sleeping or doing something else. I don't know what, when you gave the lecture, but you gave a lecture on the simulated uh, uh, universe theory. Can we get into that a little bit? Can you talk about that in terms of reality, the simulated universe theory, the possibility that this might be a, a part of this? And then I'm going to go to questions. We have quite a few questions, so we want to zip through the questions. Okay. Uh, April 2016, New York City, the Science Museum. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was the moderator of a panel of physicists, astrophysicists, and mathematicians that included Randall from Harvard uh, and James Gates from the University of Maryland. And the question before a packed audience, the museum was a wall, they were standing room only for the question, are we living in a computer simulated universe? James Gates at the University of Maryland is somebody who is a, a expert in supersymmetry and superstring theory and he was doing some particular analysis of quarks and subatomic actions when he discovered something strange. In the math, he was finding repeating reiterations of what we would call the kind of code that we have in servers in Earth's computers to try to cut down on mistakes. It is a very specific kind of code. At that panel, he said, why would this kind of code for eliminating mistakes in computer code be in the world of subatomic? And that is one of the reasons, part of the reason why this question began being phrased uh, in the last couple of years especially, could this be a computer simulation? It, it demands a couple of things. You have to realize that if it is a holographic universe, the projector cannot be in the same universe. The projector has to be outside of this universe, which then immediately comes to multiple dimension. And that there could be a dimension that is projecting this universe. Supporting that idea was a book that came out, I think it was 1991 or 92, by Michael Talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T. It was called The Holographic Universe. And I was a speaker at a conference in the Midwest in the United States with Bud Hopkins and some others when that book came out. And it was the discussion at the conference. Could we be living in a holographic universe? When I went to the airport, Bud Hopkins was flying back to New York and I was flying back to Philadelphia and we ended up getting seats next to each other so we could talk. And because Michael Toblett's The Holographic Universe had been the subject in the conference with a lot of uh, private discussions, Bud said, I want to tell you something in confidence. Michael Toblett has been one of my human abduction uh, subjects for the last few years. And he told me when he was finishing up the manuscript for the book that the entire book came from a telepathic download from the non-human intelligences that had been interacting with him throughout his life. And Michael Talbot uh, in 1991 to right in there was only 37, I believe. And I remember I was almost shocked when Bud said the whole book was a telepathic download from the extraterrestrials that were dealing with Michael Talbot. And I wanted very much to meet him and sit down and talk with him in New York 
And within, I believe, six or seven months of the release of Holographic Universe, he died. He died at an extremely young age from a strange, aggressive cancer that took him out right after that book came out. But all of you today, I feel, Bud is gone. Michael Talbot is gone. Many, many, many years have passed. And that, in fact, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't share with you what Bud Hopkins told me on that airplane. Because this is part of the story that when we agonize over could the whole UFO ET phenomena be something insidious and uh, something that contains evil, whatever the dark part is, the bright parts are exciting and exhilarating because I think that Michael Talbot was pointing us in the direction that was correct and that that <coughs> that it was a non-human intelligence who was trying to reach us and say, you're living in a holographic universe. And out of that panel, in the last only, uh, just since the beginning of 2017, there have been, I would say now, a dozen papers that have been coming from a variety of scientific units. I'm working with several people, where they are now, one of the papers is saying, let's try to test how we would confirm if we're living in a projected universe from another dimension that is projecting this as a holographic universe. And if we can come up with tests that relate to the fractal patterns, that relate to the spiral, that relate to something that fits into projection, let's publish it. Those are the kinds of dialogues that are going on now. If we are projected, if this is a projected universe and you look at the yin and the yang and our history on this planet related to the whole issue of the divine versus the non-divine, Tom Campbell, the physicist who has been on a thousand YouTubes, says he is convinced this is a computer simulated universe and he says, this is a universe that was made to counteract entropy. In fact, he calls this universe an entropy uh, reducing trainer for souls. If we knew that all of us were in an advanced university to get our souls from one dimension into a different dimension, and we were told the truth, it might change Earth to less, less violence. These are all woven together. This is, this is the most complex braid, because we are talking about the very essence of what are humans. What is our original source? But what are we now? And where are we headed if we can get past manipulation by outside influences in which some seem to want to keep humans at war, false wars, phony wars, phony violence, if we can get rid of that, what might open up next? And my own feeling, Grant, I don't know if you agree, but I really do feel in my gut, if the whole planet all 7.2 billion and counting, no matter what their history or what their internal beliefs, we're told the truth, we are not the only living system in this universe, that there are billions of planets with life forms on them. Earth, get your act together, because we have an exciting universe to explore. That's what I hope for. Yeah. That, excellent. That's what Reagan had said, how we would unite and realize we're just all humans and we're all just God's children, that, we're, that we're, the divisions would sort of divide. So you're right on there. Um, I'm going to go to a few questions now. And this is the question of the night. This is my kind of question here. Uh, tell us something you haven't disclosed before. <laughs> well, let's see. 
Because this, this is going to be on uh, YouTube, so uh, we need to scoop to get people to watch. <clears throat> There's so many things that came to my mind, but I'm not supposed to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. That's one of the things uh, that, for those who might not understand, 38 years where so much of it are people saying, I'll tell you my story, military, abductee, uh, agency, but you can never reveal my name, my location. And so you're walking this strange razor blade path all of the time trying to protect people while getting the information out. And I would say right now, if we do another one of these meetings at the beginning of 2018, I might be able to tell you about one. Good. So let's do it again. <laughs> okay. Um, you, uh, many years ago, you contacted me. This is sort of a related question. Um, have you been contacted by, say, famous people? You don't have to give the names, but very famous people that people would be shocked at who are actually interested in and asked you questions about this kind of stuff? Well, I can share that I called up Steven Spielberg's office back in what would have been around, let's see, it would have been after Reagan had him, uh, Spielberg at the White House in 1978 I did uh, Strange Harvest in 79. I think that this phone call was around 1988-89. And the reason was that I was working on a story and uh, one of the people from the shadows had said, you need to try to call Steven Spielberg and ask him now a decade or so after the White House uh, dinner and screening of, uh, it, of Encounters to tell you exactly what President Reagan said to him that night. And he said, I think the time is right for you to do this. So I called up, I got a hold of uh, Steven Spielberg's personal secretary. I said, I'm a TV producer. I've done a documentary, A Strange Harvest. Uh, I work in science and I am very interested in being able to interview Steven Spielberg uh, about the uh, the night in the White House with President Reagan. And instead of her, as Grant knows, you can be on the phone with some people and you know immediately within 30 seconds that you have asked something that they are never going to help you with. She had a completely different tone. She said, yeah, I will. Uh, this might be very interesting for him. He is in Singapore right now. He's working on a scout shoot. Uh, it may take four weeks. But he said, she said, I will definitely put this in front of him and uh, I'll get back to you. So four weeks later, I hadn't gotten a call and I called and she answered again. And it was very friendly. And she said he's been delayed in his return to the United States. And she said, but uh, I will, honestly, I will try to put this in front of him. I think, and she said something like, I think this is important to ask. So I had encouragement twice and I thought this would be, I'm going to fly to Los Angeles with a crew and videotape Steven Spielberg talking about that night with Reagan. That's what I was ready to do and put the money and the time into doing it. So I think it was about three or four weeks after that, that I made another call and the whole, the, that wonderful, uh, secretary she wasn't uh, re replying and i never got an answer except that the positiveness of the secretary in the first two rounds grant gave me the indication that everything that we think that reagan told him there are, do you realize there's only a handful of us uh, in this room who know that the ending of your film is true and the ending of the film was a, a group of sci scientists uh, going on a big UFO to go to a, another solar system in an exchange program 
that may or may not relate to the SERPO material that has been released in the last decade. Wow. Yeah, in, in regard to that, I, you, you and I both are friends with Bob Emenager, and I remember Bob Emenager telling me the story. I said, you know, this Close Encounters, except for the location, it sounds just like the Holloman Air Force Base film that he claimed to have had in his possession. And he said, oh, I didn't tell you. And I said, tell me what? And he said, I didn't tell you. I gave a copy to Steven Spielberg. And I said, no, you didn't tell me that. And he said, well, I told you Annie Spielberg, his sister, worked for us as a line producer and that she asked for a copy of the documentary, and we provided it, and that after it was over, Stephen's mother said, I've seen your version of the landing, and I've seen Stephen's version of the landing, and I like Stephen's version better. And you and I were involved. Maybe you can tell the story of, of your interaction with Bob, that he sort of gave you an indirect confirmation that this was all for real as well with, with uh, yeah. President Nixon. Yes. Uh, this would go back to, I, th I know, A Strange Harvest aired in 1980. Uh, Larry Fawcett was working uh, very hard on investigations, uh, did uh, that beautiful book, Clear Intent, from his policeman point of view in Connecticut. Um, he was uh, getting into Bentwaters and, and missiles and mutilations and everything. And Larry Fawcett and I had met, we had shared all kinds of things through, and I helped contribute about my own brother's uh, experience at Malmstrom when there was a 300 foot diameter UFO that came down over uh, missile Kilo 7 uh, outside of Great Falls. And this was back in 1975. And my own brother was in the Air Force, a helicopter pilot, and that night, uh, he was scrambled. Uh, they were taking uh, high, high ranking level people to go out to see this UFO that had come down over the missile silo. And the uh, UFO played cat and mouse with them, with the whole base. And my brother said it was there. Then the sabotage alert team said it's blinked out. The jets would come over. They couldn't see anything. They pulled the jets back. The helicopters are trying to get there. The big uh, light would come on. The sabotage alert team would say to central security control, it's back. We're telling you it, it, it's not moving. It's just blinking in and out like a light bulb. And my brother heard all of this. And so I had uh, contributed that to Larry Fawcett in the book. And Larry and I were going, I believe it was a conference in Los Angeles and we ended up being invited to go to dinner at Robert Emenager's house. And during a very interesting dinner, when Emenager said a couple of times to me, as if being really underscoring, he said, you, you would do well to study Assyrian literature. Assyrian, he specifically said Assyrian two or three times. And finally, at one point, he, we were talking about the work that he had done at Gray Advertising, how he knew, uh, or he went into all of the stuff that he did with Alan Sandler, having to do with going to Norton Air Force Base, being exposed to different subjects, one of them being UFOs and ETs, that they decided to do it and call it UFOs, past, present, and future, and that they were working at a time where they apparently had demonstrated that they would be able to look at film of UFOs landing at Holloman or wherever they were, and that they would be, uh, they would be exposed that there were bodies and craft, but that they would take orders, they would make the film how General Weinbrenner in the Pentagon essentially allowed them to. So they were in a position sort of taking orders on a film so it was not independently made. And this is why what I'm going to tell you next is so important. Because Emenager said he was in the office the day that they had a illustrator 
who had actual 16 millimeter film from, he used a different date. I know it was April 25th, 1964. I know this is the date. I know this happened at the Trinity site on White Sands. What Emanator said was that it was in 72 and it was at Holloman Air Force Base. Holloman probably played a role, Grant, in more than one incident but there was definitely an exchange of bodies and technology at the White Sands Trinity site on April 25th, 1964. Now why this illustrator sitting there and Emmenegger saying he's watching this is that the illustrator is holding up 16 millimeter film that had been made whether it's Holloman or White Sands, it's the film that they ran from five cameras when three white eggs, the white egg type craft, I've been told, are extra, the Ebens with the pear-shaped heads. They're not the big black glasses. These, these are a prime intelligence and they're very advanced. And they have the white eggs and they always come in a triangular, triple they do everything in their entire existence in threes. And when the craft come down, he said it's an offensive defensive. Two are above and one below. The two above stay, the one lands. These two are always prepared to be protectors. This, the door opens, a, uh, some kind of a, a slide rat ramp came out. And he, down came Ebens, the pear-shaped headed ones. They meet, Mendoza is the word, the name that Emmenegger used, and that's still not correct. He was a biologist. There were others, but the biologist was important. And then, while the Ebens are now meeting the small group of humans, coming out of the door above is what the illustrator was drawing from the 16 millimeter film that Robert Emmenager said he was watching. It is a ropey headdress, comes up over a cone-shaped head. The eyes are drawn as larger than a human with vertical pupils in the middle. The arm, the right arm is extended out. There is a rod in the right hand. Emmenager told me himself, the rod is a mind to mind translator. That the Ebens throughout the history of the world, the sphere and the rod in so-called royalty. It is a communicator, a translator, telepathic. When a person knows how to work with the rod, you extend it, and you can communicate in the language center of the being in front of you, and the being gets exactly the language, and then the being, whoever it is, human or other, whatever it is that you're thinking, this being has it, and it just goes like this. And so communication around this rod is the telepathic way that the Ebens work with communicating with humans and other beings. And all of that is in an illustration that was in UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, the book that Emmenager and Sandler did in, in tandem with their documentary. And when I went to get permission to use that illustration for An Alien Harvest, my first book that came out in 1989, they refused. And that's when I learned directly from Emmenager that Alan Sandler had been an agent for the Central Intelligence Agency for most of his life. So they finally gave me written permission to use that illustration that Emmenager said he watched be drawn by an illustrator holding the 16 millimeter film in front of a light from when the Ebens and this ropey-headed headdress holding the rod being, came down for a meeting with Mendoza and human military 
and that there was an exchange of bodies, that we gave them back some bodies and they gave us back, that's a question. What did they give us? We gave them bodies, what did they give us? And that grant comes right from Emmenegger who worked with Alan Sandler on an immense number of projects. And I learned it because I wanted to get permission to use that illustration in An Alien Harvest and then Glimpses, uh, volume one and two. And I think that illustration is one of the most important pieces out there. But look at how it raises the question, who is, uh, oh, the nose, I forgot. the nose is huge. It's a beaked, huge beaked nose on the ropey headdress holding the rod. What is the relationship between those? Well, when we jump to Serpo, when we jump to the so-called Reagan briefing at Camp David, March 6th to 8th, 1981, you have this, the director of the CIA, you have NSA, DIA, you have all these agents there allegedly briefing President Reagan. And what do they say? That there are five uh, extraterrestrial types, the top one are the Ebens, the pear-shaped ones, and what do they do? With rapid cycle cloning, they make the big-nosed, reptile-eyed, ropey head-dressed, and there's a name for them. They make a lizard type. They come to the haploloids, they don't explain what they are, but it means that the top three of the five that they introduced to Reagan, one was the prime Eben intelligence, and the next two had been made by the Ebens with rapid cycle cloning and placed in different solar systems. That's what it says in the briefing. And the fifth is described as a, quote, ugly looking insect that can camouflage itself as blonde, blue-eyed humans on Earth. And that our government categorizes the insects as hostile alien visitors. That's how complex all of this is. Okay. Um, here's, here's a sort of a double question. Um, I'm going to read both of them at the same time. Um, what have you heard uh, people say or write regarding life in the universe that you realize is not true? And combine that with uh, what could it mean for humanity if these errors and misunderstandings went unchecked in the face of the intervention? That's a very good question. The truth is that I, as a human being who has been confined to earth in this life and have been struggling to break through so many lies and policies of denial for centuries to get to the truth, that I don't have any firsthand factual context to answer what have we been told that is definitely wrong about something out in the universe. What is happening, I think, is that in quantum physics and in areas of cosmology, that science is changing rapidly. There are breakthroughs that are happening all the time about the quantum level and these fast radio uh, bursts. Let's say uh, for a second, that the description of a fast radio burst that happened recently, and it was recorded, granted it was equivalent to half a billion, 500 million of our suns, spiking for less than one second of time, and didn't leave one data point of afterglow. To the scientists who looked at this data, they said this is impossible. It cannot be a neutron star blowing up. It cannot be, and there's a whole long list of what it cannot be. Well, I did in March a fascinating uh, recorded interview for Earth Files and Coast to Coast with Avi Loeb. He is the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard University. He is on the board of the Starshot Committee that now is involving physicists 
and a large group of people that include Elon Musk and uh, Gates and Hawking and a bunch of people. And the idea is if we can use laser light that travels 186,000 miles a second, and we can put a whole lot of lasers together in a clump, and we can take something like an iPhone, make it just a little more complex, put it in a disc shield, we start propulsing that small, they call it a wafer craft, from lasers that on the very first effort, we might get something from Earth traveling at 30% the speed of light toward Alpha Centauri, our nearest uh, star. And that in the process of doing this, we're uh, supposedly in 2026, we're going to launch with lasers, the first of these craft toward Alpha Centauri. And as the years go by, we're supposed to keep launching, trying to get up to the speed of light. If we do, we would have a craft at Alpha Centauri in four years, while we have another one that was first launched that takes 17 years to get there. So we would have craft passing craft. And the significance of this is that this is what human beings on Earth are trying to do right now. If there is an advanced intelligence three billion light years from here, which is where they recorded this astounding fast radio burst, Avi Loeb in the interview with me in March said, my hypothesis, and he published this, my hypothesis is that this is the signature of what we're trying to do in Starshot, but it is already advanced to a place that we won't be for hundreds of years. And he means that the fast radio bursts would be evidence of light speed propulsion that does not take any time to build up or stop. Well, okay, next question. Um, this is kind of a, a long one. Because of our tendency to have fixed beliefs and minds, our ability to see clearly and hear reality is one of our problematic vulnerabilities that will hamper our ability to respond effectively. Is there a guarantee that is pure, that is pure, powerful, and necessary for a natural evolutionary process for humanity to emerge into a greater community of intelligent life in the universe, as countless other uh, races have done through time, as we certainly do not have a chance of understanding this transition time from a purely human perspective now. Do you follow that? Not entirely, but I think you could ask the person, is the implication we have fixed live cycles on Earth, and at the moment of death, there is the question about whether we transition as a soul into another dimension or not. I get the sense that the person is trying to ask something about the nature of our life and our evolution towards some kind of spiritual being and something that is more advanced intellectually. And I recently uh, have been getting a lot of emails from people out there writing me on this very issue of what happens at the moment of death. And some people have had extraordinary experiences that convince them as I was talking about the cat, that difference between that which is living and the microsecond next, when it's not, what is it that leaves? And that that which leaves is the key, I think, to the recycling of the soul and the spirit. And that I am personally convinced that we have very strong, very powerful souls. And that if we die, I really do not think that biological death is the end of the evolution of my consciousness, your consciousness, or Jim Mars, who I keep seeing spinning out there with a hat on his head, like I can't imagine that he's gone from this universe. He's, he's here somewhere. 
Did, does reincarnation play a part in this whole thing, and does that change everything? I think that when I was allowed to ask a series of questions to an Air Force military person who was with one of the Ebens at Los Alamos for three years until it died on June 18th, 1952 of unknown causes. And I was allowed to ask him a lot of questions because he said that he had spent every day of his life with the being until it died surprisingly in June of 1952 in which we ran 16 millimeter film. And he said, I always thought it must be like Charlie McCarthy and the puppet because the being was telepathic and the captain had been chosen to live at Los Alamos with the being because the captain at a crash site walking with other men he said the first thing that happened was in his mind's eye that he heard and felt and saw a scream pain a call for help but when they looked and when he's looking he can't see anything in front of him and he's beginning to wonder what is this is so loud in his mind he's seeing pictures and the only thing he knew to do was to kind of hone in even though it's crash debris doesn't see a body but he's got this coming like pulling like taking a hold of his face and pulling him and they lift up some crash debris and there is this being and because he saw and felt and heard a man who was the senior authority at the site says you are staying with this being this is your assignment from here on out going with this being, and you're going to tell us everything that you learn and that's what he did for three years and at one point he said it was like being with the mind of a child or it was like being with the body of a child that had the mind of a thousand men and he said the the one telepathic communication from this being during that time at los alamos was we made you we put you here but you have to live it And we had a discussion about what that could mean in terms of the whole large story of life and death, reincarnation. And he said, he told me, he even told me, reincarnation, the recycling of souls, is the machinery of this universe. And Whitley Strieber once had an insight. He said, Linda, I am really beginning to think that some of the beings are obsessed with what, what happens at the moment of death to Homo sapien. We are somebody's made thing. But if the universe, the divine field, pulled the rug out from under cloning and hybridization by inserting a great soul into evolving humanity, then where we go at the moment of death, Grant, might be a place that these other beings cannot go and they want to learn what that is that was one of the facets that whitley streber was coming have you encountered that before um well i've spent a lot of time on that uh, the whole issue of um, the recycling and what happens that's how i started out i started out on uh doing uh, work in hospital with dying people and what they were saying and stories like that. So uh, that's that's why I asked your question. I'm obsessed with that kind of stuff, and it's interesting to see your perspective. In terms of you're talking about the live alien, um, can you tell the, one of these uh, story you told me many years ago? Uh, it's a um, story of um, cloak and dagger. Uh, you get the offer to interact with the keeper of the live alien, 
you go to phone booths. Can you tell that story and how it ended? Before I do, I wanted to share, uh, she is in your audience. Um, I know her and we were sharing some discussions about what happened when we both lost somebody that we loved or a cat. And I wanted to share because this is the time to share it. My dear pet cat passed away and I am still disturbed by the image of him lying lifeless. I can't shake it. And I meditated on what is that thing which animates us that is now gone. And this is what I received in meditation. The soul is in all living beings, but is not in this dimension. Therefore, we are always in at least two dimensions. The physical, where I, our biology is ambulatory, and the soul or consciousness dimension. When we die, we go, only not really, to the next dimension, because part of us was always there. The dimension is where poetry, music, scientific innovation, and much else reside. And I thought, if you take the simulated universe, the holographic universe, it has to be projected from another dimension. This beautiful email and the question that we all would like to know the proof of, at the moment of death, what really happens. And if this entire universe, as Michael Talbot and the physicists that are now writing papers, if they're right, this is a projected computer simulation for a reason. And if the reason is that there is a very advanced intelligence in another dimension, and it's trying to investigate the creation of universes, their evolution, but most importantly, you can get the chemistry and the physics and the heat and the light of singularity. And it expands in its hydrogen and helium and photons. But what is the other singularity that brings in biology and that the biology is linked to a soul spirit that is connected to the divine field responsible for all matter worlds everywhere. I think that is personally what interests me the most now, and that advanced intelligences in this universe themselves are trying to understand this. And if this is the key to the evolution of life in this universe, karma is what we should worry about. Right, well said, well said. Okay, now tell me my story. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully agree. I just want to hear this story about you. You had this interaction with, I think it was a captain, and they 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 were going to give you an offer to interview him. He was dying, I think, yeah. in Texas. This is who I was talking to you just about. This is this is it. This is oh. the Air Force captain who stayed with uh, the Eben at Los Alamos. That's the story I just told about the. Okay the telepathy and it was that being who told him we made you we put you yeah. here but you have to live it and reincarnation the recycling of souls is the machinery of this universe yeah that's yeah. Him. that is that captain okay yeah because I, I remember you had that interaction and you've had some some high level people that have sort of contacted you as have i've had that experience as well where they sort of reach out to you yes. and and tell you things um, let's go to, um, the question, um, what is the most, uh, important thing you're working on right now? It, it is definitely in that category of not being able to talk about fully yet. Um, I, I can say this much. I have a whole new appreciation of Tesla. 
what I have been exposed to is whether he was an extraterrestrial, full blood, in a human body. It wouldn't surprise me if we knew that was the truth. That throughout the history of this planet, there have been, whether it's avatars or people like Nikolai Tesla, who have been like inserted into, we'll call it the general average bell-shaped curve of humanness and human intelligence, like Einstein too, as if to give us a push, to push us in a direction. And Sergeant CJ says over and over from the beings that have been downloading to him, if humanity does not advance faster, we are going to face extinction. We must advance. Well, Nikolai Tesla, I think, was another one of those points in the evolution on this planet where the timeline itself shows others on the outside. We are falling into a slew of tribalism and something is inserted and the work of Nikolai Tesla having to do with electrostatic fields, having to do with Hertzian waves and frequencies is a key, is literally a key to some of the most advanced technology that we will ever have. And why did our government then choose to take all of his work and make it impossible for any scientist to have after he died. Wow, and you'll, you'll have this on your, your website, which you can maybe describe again. Eventually, I will do a lot more with what I'm, I'm, only, I'm only giving you. Yeah, I understand. Everybody here, if they would go back to, even if you've read about Tesla, Read again with the idea that the words that you are reading are an insight into a physical truth that we should have had a long time ago. This whole planet should be a machine of energy. Nobody should have to be paying public works. Yeah, you got a lot of agreement here. Um, let's bring in Doug. Right, Doug, can you come on now? Uh, we've got something I would because nine o'clock a lot of people sometimes people need to leave uh, Doug can you unmute yourself and put your video on uh, let's see okay and turn your video on um, Doug is a becoming more, I, more can a me? I can hear you but I need your video on can you All done. can you put your video on yeah and one Doug, second you're from New York City and he has done a series of uh, paintings, burn victims. He's done um, famous uh, musical people. He's, uh, he's actually a musician. He's gotten downloads, but his, he's sort of becoming famous for his whistleblower series. And I'd like, Doug, if you can get your video to come on. Yeah, I'm uh, slowly working my way oh, towards it. Okay. okay. Hi, Doug. Hi, Linda. Here we go. Oh, Doug Ault from New York City. Hello. And Doug's got an announcement that, I, that, that we're going to make here. Well, okay, it's a, uh, it's a little premature. I'm, uh, I'm up to almost 90 portraits of whistleblowers. I just finished Jim Mars recently, and they're all on my site. Um, I'm going to do 100 portraits of whistleblowers uh, with, the, um, with the mainstay of them being in uh, this topic and in this field on uh, my poor... Uh, and my purpose for this work, uh, uh, portraits, is to you know bring more to the average everyday person that doesn't know anything about the people that are talking tonight. The average person on the street wouldn't know who Grant Cameron is or who who you know Linda or many of our people are. They would know who football players are. So I decided to paint portraits of these people to bring um, uh, light to them i'm not vetting them i'm not saying i know or don't know whether their whether their information is vetted or truthful or not i'm saying that they are here and they should be looked into so long story short i'm up to 90 i'm going to do 100 and I'm, i got 10 left and uh, and i've uh, just 
Uh, it's probably a little premature, but I added Linda to the uh, series, so I just wanted to show you uh, the, the portrait. Um, I don't know if this will read very well on, on the uh, frame. Wow. Can you see that? Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. I don't. I don't have that red hair in here yet, but I was. Uh, I was aiming on working on that today, but I lost my iPhone, so my day has been hectic. The, the light. It's actually a brown hair with red highlights, and when I put on some of these lights, it looks redder. So I am sort of more brown hair with red tint. Okay. Well, it's not supposed to be a perfect accuracy, but when it's done, I'll send you the final, um, I'll send you the final portrait and, um, and you're welcome as with anyone that I paint, I've painted Grant and a number of uh, people on the uh, site, anyone who I've painted is certainly welcome to use that portrait in any way they like too. if you ever wanted to use it for uh, any kind of publicity or a book or just on your site, you'd be welcome to do that. Thank you, Doug. And where you, I think we did an interview a few yes. years back where you were seeing strange, well, UFO, UAP, whatever you want to say it, uh, in that area where you live, have you continued to see periodically the same kind of strange whatever in the sky? Yeah, well, it slowed down a little bit, and I, I think I slowed down on my intense looking, and I... Um, I, the only really, the thing that I can say about it is that somehow, uh, and I can't say that I, I know this or not. All I can say is that my intuition tells me that when I'm looking because I'm willing to see, I start to see. And when I'm looking and I'm not ready to see or I'm just not, my mindset isn't there, I don't see the things that I see when I really sit there. It's almost like they're asking me to put some time into it, like a commitment. Like, all right, do you want to see us or not? You know, so, and sometimes that's the feeling I have, but it seems to have slowed down a little bit for me. But that one particular one that you did a report on, Linda, no one has ever been able to figure out. It's just, right. it's baffled everybody. Right. I agree. Yeah. And the, uh, I think you and I have shared the question, Grant, uh, I, and others, why is it that specific bloodlines specific people seem to be focused on by whichever type with whichever agenda at any moment on the planet. And there is that issue that certain people do seem to be the target. And that in that targeting, what is it that is being monitored or provoked? And one of the things that we leave out a lot in all of this is how many times just like Sergeant CJ, are we being pushed, prodded, and provoked as individuals to expand so that we can help this move forward? Because if humans don't get out of this terrible blind hole that we have been forced into since World War II by our own governments, meaning blind, because when you look at 70 years of complete and total lies, policies of denial, people that have been killed to keep this quiet, others that have been hurt, families that have been destroyed. To what? To keep us from learning that there's other life in the universe and it's been interacting with our own planet for millions of years? How in the world did humans come to manipulating other humans with so many lies? And that seems in some ways to explain some of the situations like yours where maybe the non-humans, the allies, know that they can't shift the government overnight or they're not allowed. And therefore, if they provoke you, provoke me, provoke Grant, provoke the people in the room all over the planet piece by piece by piece, maybe that's safer. Well, uh, you make an a interesting uh, observation. You know, um, uh, I have other friends who do this pretty avidly, a few people who are always watching the sky. And there's one particular guy that I know that we both remark that it's amazing. Every time he gets these pictures, they're just blurry enough for people to say, I don't know what they are. And, and 
and uh, but just distinct enough to say I've got something there. So they they lie in this gray area where you can't quite put your finger on them to the right or to the left. But it's all of them. It's like, come on, you gotta you gotta be kidding me. One's either gotta be totally clear, or one's gotta be this. But they, it's so it's almost like they they get just close enough to get you to know that there is the other out there, but they don't become definitive, uh, almost like it would be too much meddling. Uh, uh, you know, and that's, I, I often look at it like we're like a fish tank and, and the owner of the fish tank uh, comes around and sprinkles some food in the top of the water. When that arm goes over the water, some of the fish are very observant. They see a shadow and blah, blah, blah. But the, 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 the system doesn't allow the owner to stick his hand in the tank and go like this, you know? You can't interfere with the environment like that. There's a rule, a, gal a galactic rule or something that says hands off, but you can do a little bit of, a little bit of something. That's, I, I sometimes think it's like that. Well, I would like to share here at uh, the uh, wonderful close of this meeting something that I think is emerging from more and more interviews that I'm doing with quantum physicists about this whole issue, are we living in a computer simulated universe? This appears to be a growing fact, perhaps mathematically established. And I'm not kidding about this, that in entanglement, photon entanglement, every photon in this 13.8 billion light year long universe, Every photon is linked in a net. And if you start looking at the universe as a universe in which its substructure is entanglement of photons, that net means quite literally that when we've heard people of Indian guru background say, every atom of your being is linked to every other atom from one end of the universe to the other. If we are that linked in, if we are that connected in a net of photons from one end of the universe to another, then it helps me to look at this chaotic Earth and think it really does seem more like a school because if we are all connected, how can we kill each other? Right on. Uh, mm, yeah. Right on. Beautiful. Um, one last question, um, and then I want to just quickly go over your um, what you're doing right now. There was a question. Um, we had some cattle mutilations here in the 1990s in a place called Stonewall, and one of the people here contacted you about um, that, and they just wanted to know if there was a follow-up uh, with the Royal Canadian Mount of Police. You had gotten information whether you followed up on these mutilations that occurred in the town outside of Stonewall, Manitoba? There have been so many hundreds of mutilations since then. Uh, I try to put at Earth Files only the most solid, but I literally have a river that comes to me all the time, whether it's South America or Europe. Uh, there, there are so many animal mutilations. And recently I did at Earth Files a story on uh, mutilations in Canada. Uh, there's been ongoing mutilations in the United States. And I have the, this dilemma. If I reported all of the time as many animal mutilation cases that are bloodless, trackless that I get, I think that people wouldn't go to Earth Files. I don't know if this audience agrees. So I try to put it earth files on a periodic basis, sometimes at least once every month. The best cases that illustrate the high strangeness. So Canada, I've had so many cases from Canada that I'm trying to remember this particular one, but a lot of people may not realize. They've heard about the so-called horse snippy, the reporter got the sex wrong of the horse, got the name wrong, the mutilated horse was a female, not a male, her name was a uh, lady, it wasn't snippy. That was September of 67. Before that, in southern Colorado, 
near Alamosa, Canada. It was in Alberta and British Columbia that the first dramatic animal mutilation cases made the media eyewitnesses were talking, and why were those Canadian cases so important? They are before Colorado. People saw a silver disc and reported a silver disc over a pasture where a horse was lying bloodlessly mutilated. So it started in Canada first. Wow. Hey, okay. uh, Greg, can I ask you? Quick, uh, Grant and Linda, did you did you both ever hear uh, James Fox tell the story of the film that he saw that was so rivetingly real that he said it was without a doubt, hands down, the greatest thing he's ever seen, and he can never get his hands on it? Did either of you hear that story? No. Uh, it sounds familiar. What was the what was the the thing he was seeing? James Fox said there was no farther than h half a football field, not even that far. Two guys in a car had gotten out and filmed the flying saucer just sitting over the trees. He said it was so rivetingly re real. He said he saw it. He said there was absolutely no doubt anyone would ever have any doubt this thing was so real. And he said the guy that had it said if he ever asks for it again, he'll never speak to him again. They just It broke up their relationship, and they never spoke again. And I, I, it's the type of thing I wish I could see. And I was wondering if either of you were in touch with James Fox to know if that's ever, ever doable. No, but I'll tell you that I saw with my own eyes videotape that somebody back in 1983, it was 1983, sent me in the mail. I was living in Denver. It shows the three balls underneath the craft that is like the bell. Yeah, yep. And that is as clear as, as if we were doing a commercial for Pepsi. I'm talking about a craft that is absolutely crystal right. clear, the three balls underneath, and what is it doing? The guy shot this at the end of a runway at an airport, and this craft is coming down while an airliner, a terrestrial airliner, is landing, is coming right down behind. I have that video. I sent uh, the, uh, it was uh, at the time, uh, for some reason, the, whatever it was, the video, uh, we're getting it duplicated, which I should have done and waited. I thought, I know somebody I trust, and I'm going to ask them to tell me, could this be somebody's Hollywood animation? And I sent it out, and it never got to where it was going. It was clearly intercepted. The person and I were devastated because I think it was absolutely why, why this craft and these beings were doing this, I have no idea. But my bottom line is, that was back in what would have been 1983, and I was really, really naive about a lot of things, still living as an American who trusted um, the country that I lived in and thought that I could mail this to a colleague but I think it was intercepted. I think everything we were doing was being monitored. I know that my phone was tapped because when I was working at Channel 7 as director of special projects and working on A Strange Harvest, at home, I would hear all these clicks on my phone. So I went as a manager at the local TV station. I went down to the local phone company and I said, look, this is what's happening. I would like to do whatever paperwork. I want to know if my phone is tapped. And about two days later, I got a call from somebody that had given me a card and said, yes, your phone is tapped. It is legal. And I said, well, who is tapping my phone? And they said, we cannot give you that information. That was back in the uh, 79 to 1980. So when you realize that you begin to be marked, your, your mail, your phones, you can go a path of being constantly paranoid, or what I tried to do is just keep saying, I am an American citizen, I'm an American journalist, I'm supposed to have constitutional rights, and all I can do is keep putting one foot in front of the other, knowing I'm not doing anything wrong. It's the government who has the problem about telling us the truth. 
And if they're opening up mail and listening to all of us, what else can we do but just keep going? So that's how that unbelievable videotape that I thought because it was going to a friend, there would be no problem. It disappeared in the process of U.S. mail. Well, I, I can confirm that. I just published a book called Charlie Red Star, and the best photos I had, I sent to Whit Whitley Strieber. Uh, not Whitley. Um, 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 oh, his name is escaping me now. Um, in Arizona, I sent him the photos, and they never got there. So I know what you're talking about. And that's back in 76, 77, when those photos, those are the best ones that, that we got during that period of time. Yep. Uh, two last questions. Uh, Gaia, do you have a show on Gaia? Truth Hunter. Uh, I don't know if uh, they want me to keep doing uh, an ongoing series, but it's very difficult to be in Albuquerque and do all the work that I do and then try to do an ongoing series in Colorado. Uh, a lot of people face that issue. So uh, I was very, very uh, gratified by the wonderful feedback I've gotten really from around the world on Truth Hunter. And I, I, uh, that I was asked what I wanted to call it. And I said, uh, I'd like to call it what I try to do. And I really am interested in the truth. So I don't know if the future will continue to unfold because it's so difficult to do a series and do all the rest of this work, but at least it's there and who knows what all is going to happen. I know I'm doing more television and I'm doing a lot of stuff with ancient aliens and uh, that has proved to be, for those uh, in your audience, uh, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel is now the number one program in all of India. It is the number two program in all of Malaysia. Around the world now, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel has risen to one of the most popular programs on planet Earth. Wow. And I'm saying this only in the context that all of us have been wanting the government to tell the truth. And in parallel track, there have been TV shows and other things that have been trying to open up and leverage the truth in indirect ways. And Ancient Aliens is one of them. And at least it's making some inroads. Tell us about your radio show. Well, let's see. I do every month. The last Thursday of every month, I do three hours on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie. And those are where I do uh, uh, produced half hours. And then the third hour, it's conversations with Linda, sort of like what we're doing now. Uh, John Burroughs and I do weekly phenomenon radio on KGRA. It started with us wanting to investigate as much as we could in every facet that we could come up with related to what happened at R.A. Bentwaters in Rendlesham Forest uh, back in December of 1980. And as we have done the program, the ratings just keep going up and up and up and up. And so we are now branching out into many areas. And this week on Thursday the 7th, we're having on Whitley Strieber and Barbara Lamb to evolve from some of the questions that John Burroughs himself has had, starting with this question. Outside people saw John Burroughs engulfed in light twice, December 26th and 28th, 1980 at, in Rendlesham Forest. But John says, why can't I remember what happened? For almost four decades, he can remember details up to a point and details after. And the whole missing time aspect of the human abduction syndrome <laughs> comes down to the question, how do alien minds manipulate, control, and edit human minds? And that's one of the stories and one of the subjects we're going to be dealing with uh, on this coming Thursday, September 7th on Phenomena Radio, which airs 5 to 7, 6 to 8, uh, 7 to 9, and 8 to 10, live across the United States and out into the world. Wow, and I've been lucky enough when you don't have any guests to be on your show. 
I appreciate you doing this for us. <laughs> it was. And listen, Grant, seriously, what do you expect to happen by New Year's Eve this year when it comes to the headline, We're Not Alone in the Universe? Well, um, I and Doug um, are, are very close friends with uh, Chris Bledsoe, and he still, I think, last I heard, maintains that um, the DeLong thing is going to happen. It's going to be big. Um, I've seen some email stuff from uh, indirectly from Semivan that says it's about to happen, but I'm starting to lose faith. I mean, I'm starting to <laughs> wonder whether we're being run along. And as you know, I have this sort of uh, indirect relationship with Ron Pandolfi and his wife and what they're doing. And they seem to be accelerating. And you saw the post that I did today from Dan Smith where they're talking about this uh, you know, eight-part series dealing with uh, the portal and with the Avery. Uh, it's still all there, um, but it's on the edge. It's like when John Burroughs said, you know, July 17th, 20th anniversary of contact that something might happen. There's just so many of these stories in 42 years. I've never seen as many stories of things about to break. And there's a story. I also know there's a story that I'm pretty sure will break and it has to do with area 51. I can't get into it because it's not my story, but it is a major story that involves uh, major names involved in the area 51 story that will, I, I think will rock the UFO world. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Chris Bledsoe when Chris says uh, this thing's going to happen, it's going to be big, and you hear names like J.J. Abrams and Steven Spielberg and stuff, I believe it's going to happen, but um, I'm starting to wonder why they're dragging it out the way they are. Well, um, what do you think the cargo cult approach will do from Tom DeLonge? Well, that's, that's Tom DeLong's version of that. He had that idea before he interacted with the government. So I'm not sure whether the government is, is giving him that theory. That was him and Lavenda's theory that they had before. Um, that's where I have the, the doubts where Stephen Greer says he's got, you know, 550 witnesses and he's got one impression of, of what the beings are. And Tom DeLong's got the other version and they both claim to be talking to the same witnesses, which me, leads me to believe that, Maybe they're just being told stuff about, um, you know, how the how the operation works and stuff like that. But they're really not being told anything about the beings. That that's the kind of stuff that uh, I sort of question as to whether DeLong really knows what's going on because he's saying he's talking about the cargo cult. But if you listen to Jim Semivan, uh, who's the guy who's running the operation, the CIA briefer for the president, when you see his his intro to the book. He basically is talking more of a sim theory where he's saying, um, I, I had an experience in the 1990s with my wife. The beings were in the room. It shattered my idea of reality. And anybody that thinks they can measure this, this is laughable. This, uh, how do you define something where there does not appear to be any there or there? He seems to be talking more of a, uh, a sort of a thing where it's a lot of confusion. They are running the show. That's one of the things I heard him say is when he was asked by John Alexander, who's running it? He said they are like they are in charge. They are running this whole operation and we're just sort of standing on the sidelines and watching. So to me, it's a lot of confusion, uh, but I still stand by um, whether I believe Stephen Greer or Tom DeLong. The one person I do believe, and I, I think um, Doug would back me on this. The one person I would believe uh, with my life is Chris Bledsoe. When Chris Bledsoe says something's going to happen, I absolutely firmly believe that is going to happen. And Grant, how does he talk to you about what he's seeing, either in his mind's eye or dreams now about what's coming? Well, Chris is seeing a lot of orbs. He's, he's, he does describe this. I don't push him because he's in a difficult position. Um, like he has released stuff like he released this um, um, little hints, like he, a napkin from Camp David, um, which means this is the president. This is not the White House. So he has, he's in a difficult position. He's got these high-level people around him. And I think Doug can back me up is that uh, the, the amount of material that he's seeing, the number of orbs that he's seeing, uh, owls, just in the last couple of days, it's really intensified. He has this activity around him at a greatly accelerated pace. And that's what he says is that's why 
uh, people like in NASA, ex there's some experiencers in NASA, CIA, who are dealing with him is because he has such a high level of contact and it is ramping up. It's almost like the experience it's, itself, the number of orbs, the number of films. He sends me videos and I'm sure Doug gets them as well, videos and tapes and photographs almost every single day. Well, so many people now are coming as if agitated in the human abduction syndrome. I'm, I'm getting it in spades. But everybody is seeming to be getting downloads of images. That's why I'm wondering if Chris has seen or been shown something that he would characterize as this is what they're showing him is going to unfold. Well, he, he did, as you know, he did have the encounter with uh, Doug painted the, the lady. He has this encounter with this angelic type figure, the lady, and she does show him these uh, visions of um, the end times, uh, you know, this would almost 39% of experiencers see this sort of, they're showing the screen of the, the sort of what we're doing to the, the world and stuff like that. Uh, but he's sort of backed off that. He doesn't, he, it's almost like he can't really do anything about that. And he's more into the, uh, the image of the fact that they are, uh, there's a move inside by various people to get the word out, that there's a timeline, there's an actual plan to this thing. They're not guessing. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's more what he's spending his time on. But he did see the visions. And, and as you described, I mean, these downloads, 42% of all experiencers are reporting these downloads. They are being given material uh, of scientific, technical, and, sci and, and mathematical material. Plus, 39% uh, are saying they're seeing these environmental images of the fact that, that we are at a, at a very critical time where we are about to destroy the planet. And does that, again, fit into the character in North Korea whose pawn on the Earth chessboard is manipulating him. I well, really I, personally think that the geopolitical territorial complexities of Earth, including ISIS and many other, are actually camouflaged competing other intelligences, that we really are on a planet where manipulation by outside forces is one of the big dynamics to what end do each of the competing sides, what is it that they want? The ones dealing with Sergeant CJ, they want humans to advance rapidly so that we can stand on our own two feet. There are apparently others that do want us destroyed, and that could be why there is a pawn in North Korea. Okay. Well, the way I look at the North Korean situation is we see, somebody brought this up, I just did an interview with uh, somebody brought this up and said, uh, because my Charlie Red Star thing involved nuclear weapons. That was why I believe they were here because of the nuclear weapons they installed in North Dakota. And he said, well, why don't they, why don't they leave us alone and go and deal with North Korea? So if we see North Korea who have not killed anybody yet with their nuclear weapons, and then you take a look at the, the Americans who have killed 120,000 people with two nuclear weapons, how much more of a threat are we? And some of the things that, that I've looked at, for example, you may, not, you may know, may not know that the Americans actually had on the drawing board a 10,000 megaton nuclear weapon, which would, as they described it, take out the entire East Coast or it would entirely light California on fire. So the question is, they pulled this off. There's this teller and the guy who ran DARPA drew this, this bomb up, they were gonna build this. So the question is, what do we have in terms of bombs and nuclear weapons that we don't even know about? We know about the, the simple stuff. What is there that they may be afraid of, of, of us as, as much as the, um, the North Koreans and that the whole world is totally messed up and that maybe that is part of the reason why there's this interaction and these experiences getting these messages to say the time is running short to turn this thing around and have this oneness thing that you described where everybody's entangled, everybody's one, and we realize that we're just human beings and stop the divisions. And the insanity that you just described for any humans anywhere on the planet to make any kind of device that could take out the entire state of California or the entire East Coast or beyond, that is insanity because there is no winner, there is no gain, 
something like that set off in the Northern Hemisphere, the radioactivity will make all of us sick and many people will die. It, this is a game of insanity if it were played out. So what I'm saying is if there are chess game players that have been competing with each other for millions of years and they do this through life forms that they manipulate and tweak and evolve and hybridize and clone and that we are in that category except something put a very special soul inside of these particular chess pieces then right now at this particular point in the 21st century where we have thermonuclear being put in our faces rubbed in our faces again is it possible that because we have souls now that have experienced what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That there will be a pushback finally from humans and that this is what it's going to take for us to get out of being a subjected, manipulated life form on earth. We may be actually being pushed out now, finally, to stand on our own two feet and it won't be easy. Okay, and I agree with you that you and I have sort of a mission that the best scenario is that everybody knows what's going on yes. so that the most people can make the decision rather than five people making the decision for the entire world. That's right. And hope to God that nobody has California state annihilation weapons. Hey, Linda? Yeah. Lin Linda? Yes. yes. Uh, and Grant, have you given thought to the possibility, it's just a thought, I, I would really don't know, that um, we already have an agreement with them as to how to play this game. So, so like big chess pieces, uh, we're already on the back channel set to saying to Kim Jong-il, you do this, we'll do this, we'll make it look like this. We'll play it to the world this way and we'll get everything set up in a certain way that we're looking for. Because in the meantime, and with all the superpowers, like in the meantime, uh, Dennis Rodman, the basketball player, goes over there like, you know, having a good time sitting down with Kim Jong-il talking basketball. Come on. How is that happening? How is the most dangerous, supposedly this dangerous leader over there? We got, I mean, Dennis Rodman should be the Secretary of Defense if that's the way it's going to work. He just goes over there and sits down and talks with this guy. Maybe it's all a big game. And um, I don't know, but um, it's ab absolutely true, Linda, what you said. This is, if on face, this is true. This is an absolute game of insanity. I mean, it shouldn't even be, they sh I, it shouldn't even be a word used on, on the news for anybody to hear this kind of thing. So, but the world is interconnected. How could, how could China... Uh, exist? How could Russia exist without the United States, without the United States buying all their material? We are an interconnected planner, aren't we? Uh, don't we? Haven't we set up a game where everything is kind of hinging on everything else? So I don't understand how this could happen. Well, there, there's, a, there's a statement that was made by Dan Smith just in the last couple of days on the blog with Ron Pendolfi, and you may have seen it, was he stated that Ron Pendolfi in, on a last cruise, which would probably be um, December, actually went to North yeah. Korea and that the whole thing is a, is a total scam. It's yeah. fake, fake news type stuff that Ron, Ron was actually in North yeah. Korea. And, and Grant, did you hear this? I don't know if you picked this up when on the last uh, uh, presentation that the princess and uh, Ron made, and this is public knowledge because she said it straight out. She said, whenever I hear the top news story, I don't pay attention to it. The story is somewhere else. Yeah. So if North Korea is the top story and it's on, you know what, jump over to uh, CNBC uh, uh, to uh, the financial report and they don't even care. The stock market's going wild. Everyone's doing great. It's almost like the news is separate from another reality, which is the money world. The money world doesn't see the money world isn't going, oh, my God, do this with your money because this is ready to happen. They don't even care. And uh, like I said, the princess happened to mention, I heard it, she said, whatever is the big news story, I don't pay attention. Wow. It's something, something else on the side of it that's going on. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's, um, you know, it's, it dissipates. So I don't know. I mean, it's a dangerous 
game to play in. Uh, but um, I mean, I think I think simply Fukushima being probably the biggest problem I've ever heard in my life. That's unreported. That uh, the gift that keeps on giving. If if nuclear uh, radiation and waste is harmful, and you have to believe it is. If it's harmful, how this truth of this thing that's constantly dumping radiation into the ocean every day, nonstop since it happened, how is this not front and center on the news? And my my guess is because you can't tell the truth about it. How can you tell the truth about Fukushima? And Doug, I have done so many reports on Fukushima and interviewed people who are trying to tell the truth. And one uh, nuclear engineer from the East Coast went last year and they took their own uh, Geiger counters and they were getting huge, huge spikes in the dust in parking lots in a school. And yeah. what the, their bottom line was, the Japanese government has now made it impossible for people to even utter the words radioactivity, that the government has put people in jail, including reporters who have been trying to tell the truth about radioactivity in the region around Fukushima. So you have another one of those World War II scenarios where a government decides, like 1984, this doesn't exist. And we will make it not exist by making laws where reporters can't report about it. They will go to jail. That has happened. People, citizens, will be discouraged from getting any kind of Geiger counters. And there were people that had been taking, just a few months ago, they have been trying to take portable Geiger counters into the supermarkets in that area, all the way, out, actually going all the way across the island. And they were finding levels of radiation that you, I, and Grant, and everybody in that room would not want to eat. The government shut that down. People could not go into the stores with Geiger counters. So you're asking an excellent question. And my answer is, we're living on a planet where governments of political human beings will say this doesn't exist and they will make laws that then make it illegal yeah. to even address the problem. And we have been living with that bass backwards, upside down world since World War II. Okay, we'll have to leave it at that. Our audience needs to go. So I, I appreciate you coming on, Linda, and hopefully we can do it again. It's been, uh, as I said, you were the, the top guest. We had the biggest crowd here. So I want to thank you very much for, for doing it. And thank you, Doug, for participating and for your painting. Thanks. Oh, commentary. Uh, thank you, Linda. Okay, thank, thank you and good night. All right, good night. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye.